uh, because the SDGs, they're hard to argue against. End poverty, end hunger. Uh, that's, that, you know, create peace. But what does establishing these goals really accomplish? What does it mean? And uh, what is the, what is the trade-off? What are we, uh, what, are the, is this the best way that we should be devoting our resources? As Canadians, how can we apply ourselves to support sustainable development goals, uh, both at home and abroad? So uh, to get started, and I think we're ready, we start with our, our first speaker. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Shannon Kindorne. Uh Can you hear us? Okay, great. Can we, can we get that any louder? Yeah. Okay, terrific. So uh, Shannon is an adjunct professor uh, at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University, and her research has uh, involved sustainable development and global governance. Uh, so Shannon, why don't you take it away? Great. So, oh, you, there's a feedback there. <laughs> Okay, uh, great. So thank you, uh, Renee, for inviting me to be a part of your peace talks. Um, really uh, excited and looking forward to the discussion. So I thought basically what I would do is maybe just give a bit of an overview of the sustainable development goal process, sort of where we started, where we arrived. Um, I'm going to speak a lot about how they're different from the Millennium Development Goals, and then I'll talk a bit about sort of what's next uh, in this process. So many of you are, I'm assuming, familiar with the Millennium Development Goals. Certainly about three years ago, there was a conversation around, okay, the deadline for the Millennium Development Goals, which was 2015, is coming fast. We need to do something about it. We need something to replace that agenda. But you also had conversations um, in the sort of conferences around sustainable development. So in 2012, we had a conference in Rio where the international community agreed that they would develop a set of sustainable development goals. And you actually had these two processes at the start being separate. Um, you know, we know that the Millennium Development Goals were quite influential in the development circles, um, and the Rio process was much more influential in the environmental circles. And so over the course of the, of the process of developing these goals, these two streams came together. Um, and we ended up with, as you all know, one set of sustainable development goals, not one set of sustainable development goals plus a set of new millennium development goals. And many people suggest that this is, um, that the SDGs have actually allowed for us to bring two communities together that have historically been quite separate and that this is sort of the merger of those communities. Now in terms of actually defining the agenda, we had a very inclusive and multi-stakeholder process. Um, I think critics would say that there's always people that are left out and that you know not everyone was able to uh, consult. But I think that there's really no question you know, that there was significant efforts put behind bringing in the perspectives of civil society, academics, private sector, governments, uh, not just thinking national governments, but local governments, um, and so on. And so you really had the UN behind this process national consultations all over the world, thematic consultations on what the priorities should be, and so on. So very much an inclusive process, and I would argue a fairly transparent and um, open process. Um, you know, you could watch uh, during the negotiations, one of the groups that was established was an open working group to come up with a proposal for these goals, and you, you could, it was an open process, you could sit in on these meetings, you could uh, watch it on UN TV, um, so, so I, would, I would suggest a, a fairly open process in that sense. And there was also a focus on learning from the MDGs. I mean, there were significant reports that came out around the Millennium Development Goals, what worked and what did not work. Um, and there was this idea that we should have smart targets and indicators here, um, but we can you know, be critical to the extent whether or not we ended up with that. Um, so where did we arrive? Um, Peter, I'll just ask you to go right to the next slide on this one, okay. um, which lists the goals. Okay. So we did arrive at 17 goals um, with a significant number of targets. We have an agenda that's integrated and um, expanded. So we have an agenda that includes the three pillars of sustainable development, the environment, um, society, and, and the economy. And, and we also have an agenda that um, you know, moves beyond the Millennium Development Goals in the sense that it includes additional uh, areas that weren't included before. And when I say it's an integrated agenda, I also mean that within each of the goals, 
you also have reference to elements of the three pillars. So for example, in poverty, you have a target around resilience, for example, um, and recognizing sort of climate change impacts. Um, and you, you know, one of my colleagues you know, worded it this way. He said, you know, you can't talk about one goal without talking about any of the others. And I think that that's a sort of a, a good characterization of the integrated nature of the agenda. I would argue that, you know, at the summit that um, we are short on, for me, concrete commitments. I think that there's a lot of, um, you know, we, we've got a very aspirational document, um, but I don't think that we have the commitments on necessarily how we're going to get there. And perhaps we can talk a bit about the, um, the conference on financing for development that happened in July before the Millennium, before the UN summit. Um, but this conference was basically a conference about the how, and means of implementation and financing questions. And I would argue that there was also short on commitments. And perhaps we can come back to this in the, uh, the question and answer period for those that are, that are maybe more interested in that topic. And then finally, there was also a commitment around multi-stakeholder implementation. So you have an agenda that was negotiated, uh, or at least had inputs by a significant range of stakeholders, but there's also an expectation that all stakeholders will contribute to realizing these goals. So that means government, civil society, and private sector, among others. So what's different from the Millennium Development Goals? Well, I already mentioned that you've got this integrated and expanded agenda. Um, you know, you saw the list there. You could see that we've got, you know, the Millennium Development type goals, education, for example, gender. Um, but we've also got peace and security. Um, you know, we've got a focus on inequality and the economy. Energy is also included, for example. So we really do have, a, you know, this what some would call an unwieldy agenda. Others, though, would argue that you know, the concept of sustainable development, in a way, has now been made concrete through these goals. So we have an integrated agenda that now tells us, in, in perhaps more uh, concrete terms, what, what do we mean when we say sustainable development? Well, here's 17 goals that tell us what we think we mean. The focus on inequality and getting to zero, that was a big um, aspect of the agenda. During the uh, negotiation process, one of the slogans, uh, for lack of a better word, that came out was leave no one behind. So really this recognition that we needed to move beyond sort of reducing poverty to eradicating poverty. Um, a recognition that if any, you know, that the most vulnerable or the poorest in society, that if they are not benefiting from progress, that we're not succeeding. Um, and so this idea that you can't say that the goals have really been achieved or realized unless they've been realized for everyone everywhere. And in that context, I would say that there was a quite a, a, a big focus, and I'll come back to this, but on disaggregated data um, and recognizing that we were going to need more and better data to really know who is being left behind. I mentioned already multi-stakeholder in, in, in implementation. Uh, folks would argue that the Millennium Development Goals were certainly at more of a government-to-government -government framework. Um, as I mentioned, this, this framework is broader. There's also been criticism that the Millennium Development Goals were also weak on the accountability side. Um, we don't actually call it accountability in the SDG conversation. It's called follow-up and review. Um, and this is, and perhaps um, others will get into the politics of why that is. Um, but, but basically, you know, my, sort of my take on it is essentially that, you know, this idea that states are accountable to their citizens. Um, and in the conversation and over the course of the negotiations, we increasingly saw a focus on learning, on sharing best practice and these sorts of things. Um, on being able to see where we're maybe falling behind globally without, you know, finger pointing um, per se. Um, I think one of the pieces that's definitely less articulated is how this multi-stakeholder agenda for which we are all responsible will also hold or have follow-up and review for other actors. So I'm thinking about commitments made by folks in the private sector, um, international financial institutions, even civil society organizations. Um, when we think about accountability in this agenda, if we're all responsible, then I think we need to be thinking about how we're all going to be held accountable. And then in terms of the actual structure, we do know that, of course, national, um, the national level will be a primary focus for follow-up and review. At the regional level, we will have elements more related to peer review mechanisms. 
And then at the global level, we'll have an opportunity for sort of a, a very broad um, uh, overview of progress, uh, including thematic uh, discussions around progress for certain goal areas. I mentioned disaggregated data being an important part of the conversation. And that really links into what's been called the data revolution. Um, so where that idea came from is basically in uh, 2013, there was a high level panel of experts that came out with a suggested uh, set of goals for the agenda. And in their report, they said that uh, they called for a data revolution. And they basically argued that, you know, while the Millennium Development Goals did lead to improvements in national statistical systems and in data availability, it was insufficient. And that actually we need more and better data to track progress. And this is not just about tracking progress, it's about informing policy making and, of course, critically, that accountability loop. So enabling citizens to have the information that they need to hold their governments to account. This idea has really taken off. I would put it in the sort of new shiny object uh, category for a lot of the international development conversation. Um, but, but people like it. Uh, you know, you've got major funders getting behind it. Um, you've got a new global partnership for sustainable development or sustainable development data has emerged. Um, and so, really, this is a space I think to watch for those that are very much interested in these questions. Um, and recognizing that it's not just about uh, official data, it's also a huge conversation around big data and citizen-generated data and so on. So, so definitely a space to watch uh, for those that are interested in sort of those data type questions. The other piece that is um, different for the, uh, for the Millennium, or from the Millennium Development Goals is definitely, I would say, the emphasis around national ownership and universality. So you have this set of 17 goals. There's an articulation in the outcome document several times that notes, you know, these will be implemented in accordance with country priorities. Um, you know, and, and just sort of a recognition that this agenda needs to be adopted and translated to the country level. And I think this, you know, given the fact that we have a universal agenda that applies to all countries, this obviously makes sense. Now, what is, when we say we have a universal agenda, what does that really mean? And how is that different from the Millennium Development Goals? Well, I would argue that this is probably, for me, I would bill it as the paradigm shift. I'm not convinced that it will actually happen in reality, and maybe we can come back to that in, in, in question and answer. But the idea here is that you're basically recognizing um, that sustainable development challenges face all countries. And that it's, not, it's no longer a north-south game, which is really what the Millennium Development Goals were sort of rooted in, right? You had seven goals that were basically for developing countries and an eighth goal that was about what the rest of the world needed to do to help the developing countries. This, this agenda is saying to us, actually, we, this, this is a vision for people everywhere. So this means that every country and should be implementing this agenda, whether we're talking about Cameroon or Sierra Leone or India, it doesn't matter. It's an agenda for all people everywhere, regardless of where they live. As such, all countries should implement. I would argue that the universality component is also about a vision, though, for global public goods. So it's also about recognizing that there are challenges that no one country can address on its own. And we can think about climate change, um, illicit capital flight, all of these kinds of big issues where um, essentially we need multilateral cooperation in order to address them. You also have, um, and I would argue the other piece of universality in a way combines those two things. So if we recognize that we have an agenda that's for all people everywhere, and we also recognize that there are things that, that, that there are global public goods and things that, you know, um, issues that countries may need help to address, then it also, I think, articulates an, a, a, an agenda that recognizes the responsibilities that the international community has to enable the realization of these goals for all people everywhere. So it's about you know, the efforts our own countries take, it's about global public goods, and it's about the responsibility that we all share to help realize those goals for everyone. So what's next in this process? We have um, the follow-up and review process. So we basically, um, when, when the goals were negotiated, were agreed to, and then announced or formally adopted, I suppose is a better way of framing it, in September, 
last year, we, we had sort of an outline of what the accountability or follow-up and review process might look like. But now we need to get down to specifics. So again, the UN did a, uh, did a consultation with stakeholders where they asked sort of uh, had a survey and they asked questions, what should this look like? Um, and they've since released an unedited report. And I should just note that this um, presentation is hyperlinked for folks afterwards if they want to get their hands on it. Um, please let me know. Um, and you can actually just click right through to read the unedited report. Um, I would say that the, I'll just give a couple of highlights around that. I mean, I go in, there's a lot more, obviously a lot more details around what that will look like, but we certainly have a high level political forum that will serve as that global space uh, where we have discussions around progress on the uh, sustainable development goals. This will be under the, uh, under ECOSOC and then under the UN General Assembly every, I believe it's four years. Um, and I would say that one of the things that's been interesting um, for someone like me that's outside of the UN system is to see the extent to which that unedited report is also bringing in aspects of rationalizing the UN system. So there's been a long conversation about the need for the UN system to be fit for purpose and the need for reform, and there's been reforms ongoing. Um, but there is certainly in the context of the SDGs, it is a bit of an excuse and perhaps a welcome one to try and look at how you're going to bring in the various committees and councils and agencies and so on that are already doing work on these issue areas and have reporting already happening. So for example, on you know, uh, biodiversity, we have a convention. There's already reporting going on under that convention. So how do we feed that information into, um, into the, the, the SDG monitoring process? Um, and you also, of course, uh, there's a suggestion to have a global sustainable development report uh, that, would, that would accompany that, that process. We have the indicator framework. Um, that's up and coming. So that process has uh, included a round of various rounds of iterations around potential indicators to go with the targets um, and goals that were set. They have, I have attempted to keep it somewhat technical, so you actually have stats, um, representatives from national statistical offices that are participating in this process, um, but you of course have civil society and other stakeholders feeding in, and we are supposed to have um, a set of indicators for the uh, March meeting of UN stats. And so far we have about 151 indicators that have been given the green light, uh, which means more or less that they will be used, uh, and then additional indicators that are up for discussion. And then I suppose I'll just maybe finish on uh, the issue of implementation and, and you know where should we be going next. And I, at this point, I mean, it's really just about getting down to business, um, you know, the creation of national plans, uh, countries need to start looking at and consulting with their citizens on you know, what this agenda might mean for them, how they should be implementing it, what, what, what's useful, maybe what's less useful. Um, you, know, you hear a lot of conversation around, um, and, and perhaps this is where my skepticism around the national ownership piece comes in, you hear a lot of conversation around this idea that um, you know, well, countries now need to look at how, the SDG, how to reform their current or existing policies to fit the SDGs. And, and for me, I would argue that it's actually countries need to look at where the SDGs can support what they're already doing and doing well and want to continue doing. Um, it's not as if it's a clean slate, um, I suppose, is the main point I'm making here. And so I think there is a bit of a question around how that implementation really works in practice and how the SDGs roll out to ensure that countries have the space to really you know, take what is useful and what makes sense for their context. And I guess I'll just end on, um, you know, the, on the, the note that Michael may be bringing up around Canada, and just maybe to emphasize that, you know, there has been a lot of work in Canada already by civil society organizations on this agenda, and really trying to raise awareness as to why this agenda matters for us. And we have a new government in this country that has included the SDGs in the mandate letter of our development minister not uh, you know, thinking of a universal agenda, it's clearly still sitting on the foreign policy side, but there's clearly better entry points um, for us to make use of this agenda as, as an agenda not just for the world, but also for Canada. And we have a government that's open to that. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you so much. Okay, so, um, I wonder if we need to, uh, do we need to do anything to the Skype, should be, He's on? Okay, great.
So uh, thanks, Shannon, so much. That really uh, sets the groundwork uh, very well. It gives us a good overview of, of what we're talking about here. Um, and uh, so I think we're going to save questions to the end uh, of, of all three presentations. Uh, now that we've set the ground uh, floor of uh, what the SDGs are, how they've transitioned from the Millennium Development Goals, um, we are going to hear from uh, Nick Sony. Nick, Nick, can you hear us? Yes, I can. can okay. Terrific. Yes, and you're coming to us from Timor Leste, is that right? That's correct. Yes. That's correct. All the way around the world into the hive. Uh, so thank you for joining us here. Uh, Nick is the board chair of the Pacific Institute of Public Policy, uh, which he co-founded in 2007. So he has worked extensively on economic and public financial management issues across the Pacific since 1996. And Nick has a really interesting perspective in that he's worked both for civil society uh, as well as governments on issues concerning uh, sustainable development and SDGs. Uh, and he's going to provide us uh, with that perspective and, and the perspective from uh, working in the Pacific region. Uh, so without further ado, uh, here's Nick. Hi, uh, good morning everyone and thanks for uh, inviting me for this uh, talk. It's very exciting. Um, just at the outset, I'd like to say that whatever I say is not the views of any government that I work for or even necessarily the NGO. Um, because what I'm going to try and give you is um, a feel for what's, uh, what's happening on the ground, like how these uh, goals, etc., what they, what I understand they mean to people in developing countries, and in particular in the countries in which I work, and some of the areas that I specialize in in terms of fragile states and conflict affected states. Um, so just so they get an idea of uh, what these countries were hoping would come out of this SDG process. Um, so uh, at the outset, um, it, just to touch on what Chan was saying, was there was a need uh, recognized, and it was felt quite deeply in a lot of the countries that I work in, um, that the NDGs were really, really good but they were a little bit simplistic. And, you know, they kind of said, well, all problems in development can be narrowed down to these few simple targets. And that's fine, there was nothing wrong with that, because at the time, I think the development debate needed a bit of focus. But uh, when you're working like PTX doing, let's say, South Sudan or East Timor or Afghanistan, the, the situation on the ground is far, far, far more complicated um, so you can't just say, okay, if infant mortality hits X, everything is fine. And there was another problem as well, um, which was that for a lot of the, the countries that were coming out of um, civil conflict, it's almost impossible to meet those targets, those NDG targets. So as an example, in a lot of the countries I work in, if you take something like maternal mortality, you could see after the conflict was over, a rapid improvement in that indicator. So, you know, the indicator might improve by 60-70%, but you don't hit the target. And when you don't hit the target, there were some commentators in the world who would then call you a failure. And that's, that's particularly sad and painful because some of these countries are, on the one hand, trying to avoid another conflict and another war and all the issues that come with it. And they've done fantastic work in terms of improving access to health and education, but because they haven't met that indicator, people then assume that everything they've done is wrong. So I think it was with that in mind that a lot of the countries um, that I'm lucky enough to, to represent uh, and, and also some of the civil study groups, we, we came into these discussions with that in mind. Um, and there was one particular group called the G7 Plus who represent about 19 fragile states who, who I was lucky enough to, to represent in New York in, in the actual discussion. Um, and that was particularly uh, a view that was felt by them, that we need to really understand uh, the reality on the ground. It's, it's not just about you hit an indicator and life is good, it's about where you start off, the, the, the context in which you're trying to achieve these things. So that's why you know some people say, well, the SDG you know might might not be a success because they're big and complicated. Whereas from 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 the point of view of the country that I work in, actually they are a success because 
we're now beginning to really look at um, uh, the problem in, 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 in some more detail and with some more understanding, as, as I think Shannon was saying earlier. However, having said that, if, you know, and the other point to make is that um, when, when the debate on MDGs was opened up, we were all a bit nervous because, again, when you're in New York, you have to understand that a lot of these companies are very poor and they maybe have just one person in that room. You're then up against, let's say, the United States or Canada, who have teams of hundreds of people. And what's happening is there are like 10, 20 meetings going on simultaneously, and they're all important. And, and, and the developed countries can't be there. They literally can't physically be there. Um, and so there, were, there was a little bit of, we were all a little bit scared going, oh, if you open this up, we're going to get hammered because, you know, suddenly these, these really rich and powerful countries are going to put their air agenda down because it's, we just don't have the resources to, to, to negotiate with them. We're going to get overruled. And so, again, that's why, you know, some of us say the SDGs are a great success because they did manage. The UN did a good job in making it inclusive, trying to open it up. Um, and actually, even just getting a consensus, you know, there was times when, when most of us thought it would never happen. Um, so that, that, that's important to remember, that when you open up a global discussion like this, you get thousands of viewpoints, and to actually get the world to agree on 17 was, was a remarkable achievement. However, having said all of that, you know, some of us are still quite concerned, because what we're seeing now <coughs> is that some of the victories that the, those, who are, those of us who are pro-development had in the, in the goal-setting process, um, what we're seeing now, to be perfectly honest, is that the geopolitics are now coming into the target. What we're finding is that some of those really, really hard-fought victories um, for everything ranging from environmental targets to targets on peace and stability, the very arguments that we were having in the goals, what, what's happening is that some of the countries that perhaps felt that they didn't get what they wanted in the goals, they're now trying to get what they want through the back door, which is the targets and indicators. And that's now where, again, a lot of the countries that I work for um, and represent are very, very nervous because even what Shannon was talking about, these 151 targets, personally, I don't agree with most of them. Um, but you know, there's a real fear now that, actually, if you look at the targets, they bear a very, very <laughs> relationship to the goal. And so a lot of the countries that I work in are pretty nervous about this because, again, going back to the point that Shannon made, the whole point was we have some high-level aspirational goals, but in terms of what we're doing on the ground, that should come from the countries themselves. They should be coming up with their own targets and indicators as to how they're going to meet those goals. It shouldn't be top-down. It should be a bit of bottom up in this. And there's a real concern now that because some of the geopolitical battles were lost at the goal level, they're now being reforged at this target level. And again, because some of the poorer countries or some of those fragile sex countries, we don't have the resources to go into all of these technical battles. It's kind of happening so fast without us that we're, there's a risk that, um, you know, we're go they're going to be held accountable to targets that really don't represent what we were all hoping would be the intention of the, um, uh, of the goal. And that's why a lot of us uh, in the country itself are saying, look, maybe that we should then focus on the country level indicator, uh, the country level indicators and make sure that they at least are, are reflective of what the countries themselves want. Um, the other concern that we have in, in the countries, again, that I work in, and this touches on what Shannon was saying about the data revolution, that's all fine, but in most countries that are working, we have no data. So there's a real concern that if you ask for super disaggregated data, certainly most of the countries I work on will fail instantly because we just don't have the capacity to collect data. That's where things like PT come in, because with modern technology and ICT, and with proper investment in these things, then you can collect that data. I'm just saying that the reality on the ground is that it's not being collected. And so again, there's, 
It's concerned because what was happening with the NDGs and with other sort of these global indicators that people like the World Bank and the IMF come up with, and, and what maybe some of you or your, your participants in the debate don't know, is that the data behind them is essentially fictional, pretty much entirely fictional. So what they'll do is they'll say, oh, well, we couldn't get the data, so we asked an NGO to do a perception survey. And that might be like three mates of the guy who ran the NGO. And it will usually reflect the political bias of that NGO. And so what you get is you get you can get countries being completely vilified in the development agenda for so something they didn't do, but they say that three or four years out of date, that was based on the perception of, you know, a particular thing. <coughs> and so there is a bit of risk with this um, with 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 the way some of some of these um, uh, targets uh, are being developed. And, and again, that's one of the real fears that we have in the, in, in the developing world and certainly in the countries that I represent. It's one of the big challenges we're going to now have uh, into the, going into the discussion that Shannon was talking about in between March and June. So in terms of what next, um, for a lot of the developing countries, <laughs> those who still have the stamina to <laughs> continue this battle, because most of us don't have the resources or the stamina to do this, um, it would be to try and focus uh, a bit on this period between March and June, many of which the discussions will be in New York. And once again, sadly, they won't have the people there. Um, so they'll be reliant on a few individuals and a lot of very dedicated hard work by people running around between the corridors in the United Nations. And I think the message that uh, certainly a lot of these developing countries will be saying is, look, don't put in lots and lots and lots of targets. Um, as, again, the same the same, a lot of the goals are interrelated. The targets, if you, let me give an example. If, if we have 151 global targets, that doesn't leave much room at the national level. I mean, to be clear, you can't expect, you can't give government thousands of targets because then you're not giving them any policy space whatsoever. Um, so you've got to allow countries to come up with their own solutions. And if that's the case, then you can't have hundreds of targets. You, you've got to have a few and then, you know, have the detailed description. It shouldn't be top-down and prescriptive. I then otherwise we're back to the north reaching to the south, which is kind of what we're trying to move away from. So there are some um, uh, uh, real challenges in that. Um, the other thing, I guess, which is of particular interest to, to people like G7 Plus and, and some of the countries that I work in, is there's a real fear around Goal 16, which is on peace and security, and, and some of the issues of universality. Because, again, when we were in the debate, there was a bit of a geopolitical debate. There was still a lot of the richer countries saying, this has got nothing to do with us. And then a lot of... The, other countries are saying, no, this is about all of us, this is about humanity, this is a global thing, right? And so, as an example, a small example, you know, you have people trying to say, well, goal 16, peace and security, well, what's that going to do with the United States or Canada? It has a lot, you know, peace and security affects us all, not just in the sense that it doesn't mean that Canada is going to have a civil war at any time, but it does mean that there are conflict resolution issues to deal with in Canada, and also that Canada or the United States is affected by what's going on in the rest of the world and you know the fact that you can't actually have development when you have wars going on, there's refugee issues, there's all sorts of issues and so um, whereas you know there was this now when you look at the targets you see you can kind of politically see what's going on because you get one group trying to say well let's you know have a target and say it's all about governance and anti-corruption or you'll get another group saying oh no, maybe this is a UN Security Council issue. And that's where, unfortunately, the devil is in the detail. And doubly unfortunately, a lot of the smaller, poorer countries just don't have the resources to fight those detailed arguments. So this is why um, um, what happens in countries like Canada, you know, People in, in poorer countries or fragile countries or whatever you want to call it, in countries that I live in and <laughs> work in, we actually need the help of the people like you. We need Canadians and Americans and British people and whatever just to say to their governments, look, this is really important. 
don't, don't use this as some kind of geopolitical toy. Um, what, what's happening in these SDG discussions is actually important for all of us. It matters to us, you know, this, this matters to us politically, because then the discussion in New York is more likely to be based around development and less likely to be a purely uh, geopolitical spin. And again, then you're more likely to get some aspirational goals and targets. And that will give space to um, some of the poorer countries to actually start coming up with their own solution, which are much more likely to work. So I, I don't really have much more to say. I'm just trying, what I hope I'm trying to give you a flavor of is um, when you get into the details of this, if you, if you want to know, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, SDG is great. That doesn't actually mean anything in, let's say, South Sudan or Timor Leste. Well, it does, actually. It means a lot, because even right now, I'm working with several countries, and we're looking at these SDGs, and we're sitting down with the politicians and the various civil society groups, and we're trying to work out how to link exactly what Shannon was saying, all the great ideas they have to help their people into this. And that's the way this process should go, which is a bit bottom up. Um, but there's always a risk that if it becomes too, you know, uh, complicated and detailed at the top, it will become a problem. Yeah. Anyway, I don't have much else to say, so let's see what, uh, if we have any questions on that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, now that we've had a, a really interesting perspective about uh, so at the applied level, uh, some of the pitfalls that we can encounter in, in uh, looking at the SDGs. Um, I'd like to bring it uh, right back home to Canada by introducing uh, Mike Simpson. And uh, Mike Simpson is Executive Director for the BC uh, Council for International Cooperation. And prior to working for the BCCIC, Michael was the Executive Director of One Sky, uh, the Canadian Institute for Sustainable Living. And uh, yeah, I'm going to take it away, sure. Mike. Do you mind if I stand? I just like to be able to see people at the back. So uh, I'm, I was asked to uh, tackle what's going on in Canada, and then inevitably I'm going to actually talk about the sort of psychosocial dimensions of this whole SDG question, because I think that's what my own experience has sort of led me towards. So first to give you a kind of a description of Canadian responses, you all know that right, like that we signed, first of all, I, I went to the meeting in, um, and I've been involved in quite a few UN meetings over the years, and Canada was not really uh, an optimistic player on the path with the SDGs, with the Harper government. And when we, yeah. in, in September, for the September meeting, it was a fairly small group that went and we kind of slunk into the meetings and our goal was to sort of slink out as quickly as we could. And then they, they were signed off in September and they come into effect in January and in the middle of all that we had an election and we had a complete turnaround in the government. So there, the big question then is, well, what is the new government thinking? Because we could spend all day talking about the previous government we kind of know that they weren't really big multilateral players and they weren't particularly popular on some of the positions that they took. So for example, you see that the, the idea of universality, the idea that what's going on with some of these issues like poverty in your own country is something the entire world agreed to. And Canada consistently, even in the last meetings, was 100% opposed to universality. We can talk poverty about those people over there. In the developing world, we are not going to address poverty on with Aboriginal people in our own country. That's not a topic we're gonna to talk about. So there was lots of things like that where the Canadian government was really sticking their heels in. And I think I can quite confidently say that because there's a lot of evidence for that. For example, the woman who negotiated the references to indigenous peoples in the text, I think it's referenced six times or seven times. She told me, you know, that they spent 11 years fighting over the words indigenous peoples in the text just trying to get the word S on the word indigenous peoples. 11 years, that's how long it can take when you're what's called bracketing text to come up with a document that everybody's gonna sign. So to actually come up with a document called Transforming Our World, you know, and 192 nations come forward in, sept in September and actually sign it and say, yeah, this is gonna be our agenda for the next 15 years. That in itself is a, an unbelievable miracle that they do sign it. So you can imagine the Canadian government, they don't agree with universal, universality, but we're gonna sign on and we're gonna agree politically, internationally anyway. So the Harper government did that, but they weren't too happy about a lot of this stuff. Then the big question is, well, what's Trudeau and what are the liberals thinking and where does that position us? Because Canadian civil society 
was quite adamant throughout all these negotiations that we should be supporting concepts like universality and concepts like the aspirational nature of the document and so on, which I'll touch on in a minute. So the big, so I went to, I went to the one in, in New York with a, a delegation of Canadians. It was fairly well attended. And then the question, well, what's going to happen in Paris? Because Paris, you need to understand, we signed on to all 17 of these goals, but they couldn't really touch climate change because in the document they said, you know, climate change belongs to the, to, you know, the UNFCC, and that's going to be negotiated in December. So they put in some vague wording for, the, for chapter 13, or goal 13, pardon me, which sort of said we're going to reduce impacts on climate change. Urgent action on climate change, I think, is the quote. But they left the words out. So the big question then is, well, we could sort of measure where is Canada going to be in our enthusiasm as we go to the Paris discussion. And that's where it's kind of encouraging in terms of what's happening in Canada because we sent one of the largest delegations, 342 people went. McKenna, who is the environment minister, went way out on a limb. And uh, early on in the negotiations agreed to what we call 1.5 degrees of climate change. She, 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 she agreed to two degrees very quickly but there was civil society and everybody was there going 1.5, 1.5, we need to get this down to 1.5. And she said, okay, 1.5. And that became Canada's official position like that. And it was kind of fun because we were all in the room and there's this press conference going on and, and people are going, well, we don't know if that's our policy or not. Elizabeth May stands up and goes, no, McKenna said that yesterday in a meeting. And then instantly within minutes, people were Twittering, this is now Canada's official policy. We're in favor of 1.5. And that's how it happens at these meetings. So what's good is you can see very quickly Canada is shifting, shifting, shifting fast. And the question is in civil society whether we can even keep up to these guys right now. Because they immediately announced 2.65 billion towards climate change. That's way ahead of anybody that anybody uh, even imagined. And last week in Ottawa, I was sitting down with the head negotiator for the SDGs. Vincent, is Vincent Rigby's the head negotiator, right, Sean? Yeah, I was worried about that, that, that I got the title. I know he was the head of delegation, but I don't know if he's the head negotiator. Anyway, he was kind of going over some of these things and he said, wow, that 2.65 billion, that happened really fast too. So things are really shifting quickly in Canada in terms of the landscape and this opens up a huge opportunity for you as people that are in, interested and involved in the SDGs. So I'm gonna make one assumption real quick uh, and that's that you all understood and knew what the SDGs were before you came here and you have an interest in it. So it's not like I have to convince you that the SDGs are a good thing, right? But what I wanted to address tonight is what I'm noticing in the developed world, particularly in Canada, because we've been doing a lot of outreach, public engagement with the councils. So in Canada, we're organized in civil society. We have councils in every province and region. And so there's eight provincial councils and regional councils. And then there's a national council called the Canadian Council for International Cooperation. And this whole agenda of the SDGs is kind of complicated because international cooperation has traditionally meant that we're going to go out and help those people over there in poor countries with our development agenda, et cetera. And we've gone through 40 or 50 years of negotiation and that's changed from charity to partnership to partage. And you're seeing the most recent ideas on that are more around solidarity, that we're all together trying to fight the same problems. And we've identified about 20 global issues. Climate change is a good example that don't really belong in the developing world. They're shared by everybody, right? And that's where you get into this universal question about, well, how are we gonna tackle these together? I had a thought that where was I before that? Somebody remind me. Kareen's really good at that. I was just on. How you, are people engaged? Citizens of Canada. Thank you, Citizens of Canada, yeah. So, yeah, with the, the councils. So, the whole point is that the councils have gone out and they've tried to engage Canadians on sustainable development, like producing calendars and get people to take pay attention to this subject. It's a big one, right? And this is where I wanted to check in with you because what happens? Some, you mentioned smart goals, right? Time bound. What's so interesting about this particular said, if you've been around long enough, and I've been in this business for 30 years, you see these things come and go, like Millennium Development Goals, the, like the Rio was, happened in 1992, and we set a 21-point agenda, and we were going to achieve sustainable development by the year 2000. And people like David Suzuki stood up, and he said, it's the turnaround decade. If we don't turn it around in the 1990s, we're doomed. And everybody got all frantic, and we tried to solve all these major problems, and the year 2000 came around, and we never solved them. We went to the WSSD and everybody met and they said, we need to really shift this in the next 15 years and we set the Millennium Development Goals. So we need to have poverty and so on. We always had these kind of goals that we were trying to achieve. But if you read this text, and this is kind of the crux of this whole point that I want to make tonight, is that there's some sentences in there that we have never agreed upon on the planet and they're really important. The one that stands out for me 
is there's a sense in the text and it says this is the last or this is the first generation that has a chance at ending poverty and it is the last generation that has a chance at saving the planet now you get now think about that 192 people get together and say that to your generation and I, this is the generation we're talking about you're the last ones that have a chance at saving the planet so you got 192 people coming together and they're about to meet in in on in paris and they put that burden on your shoulders which is maybe you could solve poverty in this generation but more importantly this is the first generation that has a time-bound agenda a time-bound agenda now the reason why i think this is important is because coming out of paris what was so evident in paris on climate change is that we do have a time-bound agenda at this point it's really problematic your generation is the first one my generation never felt this i can tell you that in the 1980s our big preoccupation was it was two minutes to midnight on the atomic clock and we thought we were going to blow each other up. And there was a kind of an apocalypse problem, but it wasn't like this one. The climate change agenda and the agenda that we face around the changing world that we're in is incredibly problematic. So just give you an example. Two degrees is what we're talking about in Paris as the threshold for what is dangerous climate change to the existence of your generation, my generation, because I take ownership over this as well. And everybody says, well, no, really, 1.5, because what we now know about two degrees is that we're way off on the projections on what is dangerous. 1.5 is absolutely the limit. And everybody was there. Everybody was there at the meeting. 1.5, 1.5. Well, let me just give you an idea of what 1.5 means. There's a thing called the global carbon budget. It's the total amount of carbon you can puke into the atmosphere along with the other five greenhouse gases. They know the number. It's around 800 gigatons or something around there. And we know that, and that was the number that the IPC, International Panel on Climate Change, they told us that in 2011. They said, look, people, that's as much as you can put into the atmosphere or you're going to hit two degrees. So we also know what's the total amount you can put into the air before you hit 1.5. Well, it's around 500 gigatons. But that was in 2011, and since then we've gone through 287. So we've gone through half the carbon budget to get to 1.5 degrees, and we're going to hit the total carbon budget by the year 2020. It's a six year window. Now the carbon, the whole, the whole agreement that we're signing doesn't even come into effect until 2020. So you're signing a document, an aspirational document, saying yeah, we need to get this down to 1.5 degrees, but it's a done deal by 2020. It's a done deal on two degrees. Already people are saying it's a done deal, all right? So that's a problem, you see the problem? So now you sign up for a document, the SDGs, and the first thing it says is, we're going to pull, we're going to end poverty for everybody, everywhere, in all of its forms, and we're going to do it in 15 years. So here's my polling question. Does anybody in this room believe that? Can anybody put their hand up in this room and say, yeah, that can be done? Nobody. Can anybody willing to say, it's definitely not going to happen? Where you just don't have hands. <laughs> My answer is always yes, but not with business as usual. Okay, so you're a believer still. Good. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Let's do a quick poll. How many say it, it, it could happen if we, there's still a possibility. Throw your hand up. I, oh, beautiful. Great. How many say it's definitely not going to happen? Okay. Okay, let's just try climate change. Urgent impact on climate change. How many, do you, how many of you believe we could get that 1.5 that we're talking about? When McKenna stands up and says, we can do 1.5. What it means is you have to turn every single car off, every single military plane has to stop, every single airplane has to get out of the sky, every single person has to stop emitting carbon. That's not talking about methane leaks, which are now 90% higher than we think, right? I mean, that's what was announced in Paris. The estimates on carbon, on methane leaks, which are 80 times more powerful car you know ground for ground than carbon what are we going to do about that so you just quick poll how many of you think we could solve the 1.5 degree question how many think you can't solve it yeah and this is a problem right this is one of the problems with the sdgs is it's a it's a psychosocial problem if we don't believe in the agenda if we don't even think it's possible how can we get behind it and that's where what i want to pull out for you is just my own have i got enough time here am i doing okay yeah, yeah. I want to just pull out a, a concept which is called resilience. And I don't want you to think of resilience in terms of its physical dimensions, which is how we normally measure resilience. So you go to a culture or another place and you say, ah, it's not very resilient because they don't have this, that, and the other thing. 
Resilience, by the way, the, the definition of resilience is basically a resilient system or society is one in which you could pull parts out, you could take parts out of the system, or lots of parts, and a really resilient one is one that can take a lot of damage. A, 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 a non-resilient system or society is one where if you just hit it with one little thing, the whole thing falls apart. So in ecosystems, if you have a very biodiverse ecosystem, it's very resilient because if you knock just one animal species out, the whole thing will keep going. But if you have just a monoculture and you knock out, or if you knock out most of the forest species and you have no more biodiversity left, if you knock out one major species, the whole thing collapses. So resilience can be applied to our thinking as well, right? And this is where what I'd like to do is just share with you, I spent a lot of time in some hard, technically, physically hard places. I worked in Sierra Leone for a long time, Niger Delta. Sierra Leone, if you look at the quality of life, it's the lowest, it's the bottom of the pack always tends to be. And I used to work in Kona, which in Sierra Leone was considered the worst spot in Sierra Leone. And the one thing I've learned about these places is that, is that physically they don't look resilient. But the people that have been through very hard times, through very difficult situations, are incredibly resilient. And they don't buy into the despair concept or the giving up concept. Because they understand that life doesn't work that way. There's chance, there's all sorts of other factors that we have to pull into our psychosocial way of approaching the SDGs. Because we have too many people walking around going, this is a ridiculous agenda. Saying this is an impossible agenda. These indicators are too big or too wrong or whatever. And, and what we need more of, in my opinion, is to concentrate on, and you're not gonna believe I'm gonna quote Dick Cheney. This is like the weirdest <laughs> thing to quote, right? But I actually admire the guy because he stood up at one point and he said, look, and they were kind of, They'd obviously been brief, but he said there's this thing called the unknown unknowns, which maybe you've heard of. And the idea here is that there's these, we know what we don't know. And I've, this is crazy that I'm quoting him. But he said, but we, what's really interesting is what we don't know that we don't know. So catch this for a second. In other words, we have a set of problems that the SDGs present with us. But we, there's some unknowns out there. We don't know those unknowns yet. We just don't know them because they haven't, they're not on our horizon. They're not on our radar screen. And that's on the problem side. Now take the unknowns that are on the positive side. So you've got 7.4 billion people today. 2030 is 8.5 billion people on our planet. But you also have, you've got to work this out. You have a lot of potential in terms of where people are starting at in terms of their education these days. People think.